Hello, um, thank you so much for joining. We are gonna get started. We'll go ahead and introduce yourself. So my name is Samantha Ritchie um, and I live in Los Angeles. Oh, thank you, Lydia. Um, and I'm a design principal here at Education Elements. Um, so I'm joining you all from the West Coast um, in LA. It's nice to meet you all, super excited about the content we've got um, planned today. And Claire, I'll pass it to you for an introduction. Good morning, everyone. My name is Claire Cunliffe, um, and I am uh, currently located in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Um, I was a secondary math teacher for a long time and an assistant principal and have coached a lot of pre-service and early service teachers. So I'm really excited to dive into the content today about how we can adopt new curriculums. And I know that this is a topic that's of high interest for a lot of us at this point of the year. So we're excited to dive in together. Just so you all know a little bit about Ed Elements, who we are, uh, maybe you've heard of us before, but if you haven't, we are an education consultancy, and we believe that schools grow when people grow, and we help to transform schools and districts. It's something that we're really passionate about, uh, and at, at Elements, we have 10 years of experience. We've supported over a 1,000 schools and districts, um, and 90% of the folks that we work with are repeat clients, so we work with them on one thing, and then they want to do uh, something else with education elements, which just goes to show uh, the relationships that we enjoy building, the, the clients that we work with usually stay with us. Um, so we're super excited that you're here joining us to learn a little bit more about Ed Elements. So want to ground us in where we're at today and what Ed Element aims to do. So we aim to be a responsive ecosystem and support you all in creating responsive classrooms, right? And this might look like helping you all build personalized and blended learning in your classrooms. Maybe you're working on building competency-based education or completely redesigning your school. And then we want to support you all in building responsive leaders. And so we support in things like innovative leadership, district leaders, school leader, coach, teacher leaders. We support in executive coaching. We also want to build responsive teams. Um, if you haven't, you should read the book, New School Rules um, by Anthony Kim. It's incredible and has changed a lot about the way that I think of education. Um, we help build new team habits. We support with teacher retention, which I know is a huge topic right now, especially in today's climate of education. Um, we also want to work to build responsive organizations and give you all the tools to do so. And so just to go over our objectives today, we wanna to go over the current state of instructional materials. Then we will talk through five different steps of curriculum adoption or supporting you in, in purchasing new curriculum if that's something that you're thinking about. And then we'll have a brief discussion at the end and closing. I mean, we've got three objectives that we'd like to accomplish today, which is offering insights and strategies for adopting new curriculum, sharing resources for future exploration, and collaborating to share practices, barriers, and ideas. And I'm going to pass it to Claire um, to talk through grounding ourselves in the why. We wanted to take a couple minutes to talk about why is it so important to have high quality instructional materials. I think all of us would agree that that is important, um, but we want to really take a research-based approach. Um, and so we're going to start by just looking at some key points from a TNTP study, um, which studied 4,000 students in five, in five diverse school districts. Um, and what was really staggering to me in reading this article that um, is linked at the bottom, I would definitely recommend reading the full report, but that most students, um, especially students of color and students from low-income families, with mild to moderate disabilities or RL students, they actually spent most of their time missing out on access to high and quality instructional materials. And so the four key categories that they look at are great appropriate assignments, strong instruction, deep engagement, and teachers with high expectations. Um, and students actually spent more than 500 hours per school year on assignments that were not appropriate for their grade and with instruction that didn't ask enough of them, which means six months of wasted class time in each of these core subjects that we know are crucial to our students um, all the time, but especially as we're transitioning um, from pandemic learning. Um, and so today we're going to focus on how do you identify um, 
and implement those materials. And so you might see this probably is not a surprise to a lot of you. You might have this in your practice. I know that as an early teacher, I was guilty of doing this, but teachers actually spend a lot of time looking for their own resources. So this might be true of you or your colleagues, um, but teachers on average spend sent to seven to 12 hours per week looking for both free and paid resources, right? Um, either on Google or on Pinterest, on Teachers Pay Teachers. And most of these resources are unvetted and they might be misaligned to the resources that students actually need um, to reach the outcomes that we want for them. And so the research shows that these materials really, really matter. When average teachers use excellent materials, student learning results improve significantly. Research also documents that many teachers don't have access to strong standards aligned curriculum. And in fact, most teachers spend hours every week searching for materials that haven't been vetted and aren't connected to the ongoing professional learning activities in their schools. And we're gonna take some time to talk about how to build those connections in your context as well. So ensuring that these teachers have high quality, rigorous materials is an effective and affordable tool since we all buy curriculum to improve student learning outcomes at scale. Um, and we'll pop the article um, into the chat. This is another really interesting resource from the Aspen Institute that goes through um, how to build these programs and is a key resource when we're looking at this research. So why we all came together for this webinar is because we did our own research and this was really top of mind for our district leaders. And so um, in 2021, we did a poll of school and district leaders and you can see the results here. We were really interested in customizing the curriculum or supplementing the existing curriculum. So we'll talk about what both of those options look like. And so this uh, space is really in response to what we're hearing is top of mind for all of you. At this point, I'm going to pass it over to Samantha, who's going to start going over what is the first step in adopting a new curriculum. Yeah, and so a lot of you said maybe you're just getting started. And so we're going to talk through creating a shared vision and why this is so important when thinking about adopting a new curriculum is because everyone needs to be on the same page in your district of what is our vision for our students and where we want to go with curriculum. What do we want our curriculum to mean to students? What do we want for academic results for our students, right? Depending on your district and the expectations, what are we really looking for um, for our students to gather, learn, and achieve um, based on the curriculum that we end up selecting? Some of the most successful districts that we see have a clear and shared vision for what strong instruction looks like. And so departments, school leaders, and teachers all understand the vision and know how their actions contribute to the district vision. And now this is easier said than done as things throughout the school year can get lost in translation. But if you can start with a shared vision and ground yourself in the questions that you should ask yourself and what this can look like, you can start out on a really strong foot. And so when creating a shared vision, here are some guiding questions that we think are helpful um, just to start having discussions right, with each other, with teachers, perhaps holding calls um, and asking folks, maybe what are your shared beliefs about the instructional experience for students and teachers? What do you expect to see when you go into classrooms? Are there non-negotiables that must be part of the instructional vision? Uh, and what local context is important to this vision of instruction? You may add more questions to these, but these are just some talking points to get you all started when thinking about adopting a new curriculum. Like I said, it's important that everyone's on the same page, as well as being able to have hard conversations of like, I'm not sure what we believe right now as a district, right? Like, I'm not sure what I want to see. Getting down and being super granular with what you want coming out of adopting a new curriculum. And next, you'll want to think about, well, what does this look like in practice? And so the district should clearly articulate a vision at a high level for what high quality instruction actually looks like in the classroom. So maybe that's criteria for success. Maybe that looks like a continuum of when you're just starting out executing a new curriculum, maybe you're just running one to two lessons a week in depth. And then the goal is that you're running every single lesson in the module on pace in the first two months, right? And so just creating a vision that everyone can follow and is super clear and action oriented. 
Next, departments within the district are aligned on the vision and they understand the role that they play in supporting teachers and school leaders to achieve it. So getting super clear on what role everyone is playing um, to get to that level of delivering high quality instruction. Next, school leaders should be aligned on instructional expectations and how to support teachers at various levels and entry points. And so folks, that's why I talked about setting up a continuum for teachers that they can clearly see. If I'm a brand new teacher executing curriculum, what do I need to be doing at this phase? Okay, if I'm teaching at school for a year, what do I need to be doing? If I'm a veteran teacher, right? What kind of practices might I need to model for newer teachers? Um, and finally, getting clear on what teachers and teacher leaders um, are expected to do for their specific content area and have a clear understanding of what strong instruction looks like in practice. So really important that you start with that high level vision and then get a little more nuance as you think about what does this actually look like in practice. So after you've set the vision and you've really thought what it looks like for all those different members of your community, um, then we can start thinking about selecting those high quality instructional materials. So um, the first step is really thinking about like what meets those needs of your vision, right? And so we actually, there is a really strong market. And so how do you identify what meets your vision? So a couple of resources that you can use um, that actually, that go through these, um, diff like compare different instructional materials um, are really useful. And we'll go over those in just a second. Um, but before that, we did want to name, right, like this underpins a lot of the work that we're doing, right? So we go from the instructional vision to then what those are. And then that is going to drive everything that we do in our classrooms, right? And um, inform the rest of this, um, these domains that we see here. So for those comparison resources, um, if we go to the next slide, um, there's a lot of work being done to help us identify what are the differences between the different products in the market, where are their strengths, where are their weaknesses. Um, so a few really common ones are ed reports. Um, they use green ratings, right? That's like their highest rating for high quality instruction materials. Um, the other one that I really like using is from the Louisiana Department of Ed. And so they have a three-tier ranking system that's really helpful in navigating those strengths and weaknesses. Um, and so the materials that you're looking for really can help all students in engaging in those collaborative and complex learning that's grounded in those full expectations of the standards, right? And so these really help you think about what um, curriculum might be best suited to your populations and why. So for example, if you serve a population that has a high uh, percentage of students with disabilities, you might have different considerations than if you're serve at a school that serves a high population of an English language learners. And so these tools can be really helpful in making those comparisons. Or if you have an existing curriculum to identify what might be some of the weak spots, since you're not um, probably familiar with like every single grade level and every single lesson there, right? This will give you as a school leader that high level knowledge of what might be some strengths or weaknesses of the curriculum that you've selected. So the main questions that we wanna ask ourselves as we're selecting these are the gateway criteria. So for each of us, right? We work in states with different standards. Do these uh, curriculum align with those state level standards and the level of rigor? So for example, you might look at text complex complexity um, in your ELA and social studies curriculum to make sure that those are aligned. You then wanna look at horizontal alignment. And so what would this look like as you're integrating this across multiple subjects? Um, you also wanna look at instructional support. So again, depending if you have a lot of early career teachers or veteran teachers, are those instructional supports there to help your teaching staff wherever they're at in their continuum of development? So does it provide, what type of scaffolds does it provide? Does it provide those scaffolds that again, speak to those different populations that you have in your school? Where can you expect that students might productively struggle? Where can you expect that teachers might need some support in implementing that? And lastly, you also wanna look at that vertical alignment, right? So as you're looking in building a whole program, right? Making sure that you are thinking about, does this actually push and 
uh, offer that alignment all the way from K to 12. And so do these tasks, are they not repetitive? Do they develop complexity? So students are actually positioned to reach the level of rigor that we're expecting. So the key outcomes to consider in this phase, first and foremost, is that increased buy-in from teachers, right? So how are teachers involved in this process and what does that look like? Again, saving money over time for the district, right? If you're able to identify a curriculum that you can use over multiple years, you're able to invest both in the people and the resources and have that continuity. For teachers, it's a huge amount of save time for them because they don't have to find and create, right? That seven to 12 hours that we talked about, they don't have to do that anymore because they have the resources from the curriculum that you chose. This also improves student outcomes. As we discussed, we know that the research shows that high quality instruction materials is a huge indicator of student outcomes. And it sets those clear expectations for rigor and standards alignment across the board, which better positions both teachers and students to be successful. And also it's a huge lever in equity because it really defines and sets what the student experience should be. So it's not dependent on which teacher that they have, but rather is that teacher executing and implementing the curriculum in a way that really supports all learners in their classroom. Um, and finally, it really ensures that your vision is being brought to life, that these materials are aligned to those key priorities that you have as a district and as a community in your context. So these are the key outcomes that you wanna consider when you're in this step of your curriculum adoption. Yeah, and so we combined steps three and four, which is developing a professional development strategy and opportunities for internalization. And so when we think about pulling the pieces together, a primary role of school systems is to create conditions um, through which teachers can become the experts at teaching the curriculum they're using, adapting instruction to meet the needs of particular students, right? We got this from Practice What You Teach from the Aspen Institute. But when I when I think about this and what this really means, it is like teachers need to feel empowered to execute their curriculum like with fidelity and have the confidence to perhaps adapt if maybe they have more English language learner, learners in their classroom. Maybe they have more GNT students. Perhaps they're having students coming in with some learning differences, right? And so we need to make sure that teachers feel really strong in the foundation of the material and build their teaching practice off of a strong, a strong foundation rather than off of sand. And so when I think about this, it's that teachers feel empowered and confident. They know what the shared vision is. They understand how to execute the material. And therefore they feel like they can internalize what they're teaching and have the confidence to execute accordingly. Part of that too, to empower teachers and to have implementation be strong is to have a strong professional learning system in your school district. And so what this looks like is that at the district level, all teachers are provided with onboarding that includes professional learning skill around skills and pedagogy of the content. At the school level, teachers and leaders have opportunities to participate in content specific professional learning. And we had talked about this in, as an ed elements team. This could either be from an outside vendor or with the professional development teams within your schools and school districts, um, or perhaps you have veteran teachers that feel confident in leading professional, professional development within a certain content area, right? That's totally fine to have teachers support others. Maybe they have content team meetings, however you wanna structure it. There has to be some professional learning in practice, not just when the content first comes out, but throughout the entire school year. It's super important that this is a consistent practice as curriculum grows and changes, as teachers grow and change. And at the district level, the district shares either by offering or connecting to external sessions. They provide opportunities for teachers and leaders to participate. They have content specific materials and the curriculum will be leveraging multiple points of entry. And so this goes back to what we talked about, whether a teacher is brand new, or perhaps they're a veteran, there has to be a professional learning place for them for the pace that they're at. I say this because we all know when there's a lump sum PD for all teachers, some may be frustrated at the level that it's at. Other teachers, you know, might be a little bit confused. And so we want to tailor our professional learning just like teachers would tailor their instruction for students. And finally, faculty meetings and other school level designated time are leverage 
building te for building teacher knowledge, right? So really carving out the time for this. And folks, you can do this during the shared vision. This might look like how often do we want to do content professional development, right? What do we what do we want to see from teachers to know that things are going well versus where might we say, okay, we need to pause and step back, maybe have an external facilitator come in to go over the content. So just being really mindful and being able to gauge where your people are at. And that all starts with the shared vision and then trickles down to having a professional learning um, practice and system based on what your district and what your school needs. Some of the questions that you may want to consider, which I've already talked about, but these can be some talking points. So for, for example, what vendor-led opportunities do we need to plan and schedule for, right? Many publishers, and, and you all can see this on Ed Reports um, as well, but they offer full-day institutes for teachers and leaders. But like I said, you'll want to be mindful as summer dates can book up well in advance, often around like peak times as well, like Christmas and spring break, right? Maybe you'll want to just be mindful of what days people are available to come in and deliver this professional development. Um, and then after that, you'll want to think about where can your internal professional development team lean in? Like I said, maybe that is school leaders. Maybe that is veteran teachers and you can empower them in that way. I've, I've done that um, as when I was an assistant principal, I had a science teacher lead content development because she had done the content for 12 years, super veteran at it. Um, and so she felt very empowered to lead those sessions um, and actually I think did a better job than I could have myself. Um, so just think about those people um, as you start the school year. And like I said, who internally has those expertise to build and lead those sessions? You may want to start reaching out to them, right? And think about, are they able to lead a session in the fall when things get really busy and content can kind of go to the wayside with assessments? Um, so start to think ahead and start reaching out to people that you think may want to um, or may want the opportunity to lead some professional development. And what you'll want to think about is how might this look in practice? Well, it would look like the district providing guidance on the why behind lesson internalization, why it's important, always grounding back in that shared vision. That's why it's really important to get specific on what you want your vision to look like. You would have planning documents for units, lessons, and assessments that exist and are readily accessible by teachers and leaders. So how are you, how is your content team or maybe vice principals going to build out these documents or who is in charge of doing that? Making sure that that's really clear before the school year starts. Next, thinking about the school master schedule, right? How will that support common planning and PLCs? Like I said, planning groups, how will you make sure that the schedule allows for that time and that space for teachers to have those conversations, to get together, think about their lessons? And thinking about do teachers have access to the clear expectations around use of planning documents and pacing guides? Do they have the resources they need to not only receive it in a session, but then to execute it on their own during their planning time? Is there a regular classroom observation and feedback cycle grounded in the vision for strong instruction, right? Are teachers getting feedback on what they're doing? Are district leaders, are principals, assistant principals looking at lesson plans and saying, do these align to the standards? Are they aligned to the curriculum that we originally adopted, right? Are teachers providing scaffolds for all students? So things like that are really important to consider when building out um, this in practice. And do PLC meetings follow protocols that allow teachers and teacher leader opportunities to internalize re resources, right? So what is the protocol of these meetings? That might look like a sample agenda. That might look like talking with the leader of the PLC team and making sure that they're clear on what needs to get accomplished. Um, and so a lot of this is brainstorming, reaching out, right? All grounded in the shared vision that you'll want to create before adopting new curriculum materials. Now that you have done all the hard work of identifying what curriculum you're using, setting that shared vision, and creating a plan for implementation, you really want to then identify what are the ways that you're going to monitor progress and implementation for this. So when we think about this stage, right, we're thinking about what are those like bright spots that we can share out and really use as examples to build buy-in with teachers? What are different gaps that we might have and how can we use those systems that cre we created 
um, for professional learning to address any of those gaps or misconceptions and ensure that we're really reaching those outcomes that we set in our shared vision. When we're thinking about progress monitoring, we can think about it in a couple of key ways. So the first way, which is backed by research is to think about it in content specific ways because we want to make sure, like Samantha said, that teachers are getting really applicable and meaningful feedback based off their content. However, we also want to think about what are those general content agnostic questions that we can ask to ensure that implementation is happening with fidelity and is meaningful in all of our classrooms. And so the key questions that we want to ask ourselves and see in our schools in progress monitoring are, is the teacher actually using the district provided resources? And I know this sounds basic, but I will say that as a school leader and then now in the different schools that I support, um, you will be surprised that because this is a difficult process, a lot of times teachers don't implement the district provided resources. And so that's a key spot we wanna be able to name for teachers to increase that buy-in of why using the district curriculum that is aligned to those standards that is research-based is going to benefit students. So that's the very first question we wanna ask when we're going into these observations. We also wanna think about, is this lesson within five days of recommended pacing, either before or after? And I would say that this is actually a huge struggle when we're initially adopting curriculum. You probably have seen this in your experience when you go into classrooms, especially towards the end of the year where teachers are struggling and maybe have to cut whole units. We don't want that to happen. And so the more that we can be in classrooms and observing and giving feedback and actually know where are teachers at in terms of pacing, we can provide that targeted in-time support. Um, this also helps us, which we probably a lot of us experienced during the pandemic, if teachers are having to prioritize which units or which lessons, if we can make that at a school or even district level decision, that's going to ensure equity for students because I know that if I'm sending all of my Algebra 1 students to geometry, but I know that all, none of them reach the last unit, that geometry teacher can then actually support them in that learning the next year, for example, right? We actually know what are those experiences that students may have missed out on, or if a student is a, if a teacher is ahead of pacing, we know what experiences might be redundant for students in the following year. So being able to make those pacing decisions at a school or a district level is really helpful to ensure equity for all students in their learning experiences. We then wanna think about, did the teacher maintain the integrity of the lesson? So what this means is, for example, maybe I have teachers who are always on pace, but when I actually go to their lesson, I'm gonna use Engage New York math as an example, they start with a fluency portion and then they go into higher order thinking. Maybe my teachers are on pace, but I realize that every time I observe, I'm only seeing fluency. So my teachers are staying on pace by not maintaining the integrity of the lesson. They're cutting out that higher order thinking. And so I wanna see, are we actually ex having students experience all levels of rigor in that lesson as it was designed? And lastly, did this lesson actually meet the full expectations of that state standard? So are students meeting or on their way to meeting the level of rigor that's expected for them to be successful on those um, statewide assessments? So before we jump into our next discussion, we do want to open up the space for questions. We know that we gave you a lot of information. So I see that actually Stephanie already posted one. Thank you, Stephanie. So the question that Stephanie posed is, are there suggestions for pacing when there are several substitutes in the building? Um, so I would say, again, this I think is up to right? Like there's a lot of different school contexts and district contexts that would um, change your answer for this um, or maybe impact how you, you support teachers with this. And so we know that that's the reality of schools these days, um, and that's very tricky to address. So in terms of pacing, you would still want to support those teachers as much as possible to stay on pace because hopefully, you know, those students are not having a substitute the next year for that. I know that there's a lot of different ways that this might look. For example, a lot of curriculum these days do have virtual learning options or online 
platforms that might be able to support someone who either is a substitute or is not certified in that content area to ensure that students are having access to those materials, even though their teacher might not be as um, informed about the content. However, that also requires all those other pieces that Samantha talked about in terms of professional learning, observations, and support for those substitutes, right? So what does that look like to ensure that those substitutes are actually being given those materials, whether that um, is thinking about access to how substitutes are planning or getting those materials, what are their in terms of their contract, what does it look like? How involved or not involved are they in that process? Um, so I know that at my school last year when we were dealing with that, um, I set up like a separate professional learning experience for substitutes and we were able to pay for them to do that so that it still honored like their contract so that we could ensure that they were uh, meeting those content level expectations. Thank you, Stephanie, for that question. Yeah, and Smith, I don't know if you have more to add to that. No, no, the same thing. And I, I just put um, an answer in the chat too, but I think like having substitute plans is really important, like having a plan for them, right? Or if it's a long-term substitute, like school leaders getting together and being, okay, what is, what is the best thing that we can do for students? Like you said, Claire, using those virtual platforms. If it is a longer term thing, how can we get them professional development, even if they're not an expert in that content area? Yeah, see your question, Vanessa. So when I think about differentiating PD, I would say the first step is finding folks who can lead that particular session. So getting clear on like, great, do we wanna have a new teacher PD just about X, like writing a lesson plan, right? Because maybe our veteran teachers don't need that. You'll wanna find someone who can run that PD. Also carving out the time. I know one thing that I've done that was super effective um, was during our regular after school PD time, we would have differentiated PDs um, that we would specifically group teachers into. Um, or if that if that doesn't feel good for your school or for your district, we would have choice session PDs. So it was like, there are these three different PDs going on. You can choose which one you go to. If you're struggling with the actual content, that might be a place where you reach out to uh, external vendors for support. Maybe you reach out to teachers that are really strong at writing lesson plans and ask them to write a PD. Uh, I actually did that for a, a math PD where I really needed support with like, how do I differentiate for English, English language learners? Because like math language is really hard. And I had a teacher help me write that section of the PD. Um, and so just using those resources, but I would say time carving out like who would benefit from this PD and then reaching out to external resources for the content if you're not entirely sure how to create it. Um, Claire, anything to add? Yeah, I agree. And the only other thing I would add is what I have implemented and also seen being uh, done successfully is almost creating a scope and sequence for the year for your PD. So you can differentiate it ahead of time. So if you take your instructional vision and you think about what do those teaching competencies look like for a brand new teacher, versus what do those competencies look like for a experienced teacher, that will kind of naturally help you predict what support those teachers might need. So what I mean by that is maybe you know that in the beginning of the year, you need to focus on those culture PDs. Maybe that's what you do whole group. And maybe for your veteran teachers, you're actually really going deeply into, like Samantha mentioned, um, vocab acquisition for your L students potentially you empower them to do a PLC at the same time and then you switch. So the um, you can also use right like different structures so you're not having to deliver multiple different PDs but either use PLCs to support or think about how can you use that same time to divide into different groups. But I do think that it needs to be grounded in what is that vision for instruction and what are those capabilities that um, teachers need to have at different periods in their development to really understand what type of experiences you need to design for them. Um, we have one more question in the chat. I can, I can speak to this a little bit, Claire, and then you can hop in. So the question is, I'll read it aloud, is I'm working with a team to consolidate and prioritize the standards in order to cover content by midterm. They are three weeks behind. Historically, they only cover three out of the eight units. Um, and so wondering what strategies might you use 
to shift mindset. Um, yeah. So the first thing that came to my mind, Kenya was starting with the shared vision. Right. And so that's why it's important to be like, this is our vision as a school and like what we want for students. I find that like, when I root things in kids that tends to land better than like when I root things in content, it just depends, but like typically with teachers, right. That really love kids and are there for students, like grounding everything that we do and like why this is important for students 10 years from now or five years from now can really help teachers be like, oh, like see that bigger picture. Cause I think it's easy to get bogged down of like, I have to do this content. I have to deliver this lesson, but asking yourself, like, why is this important for the student's future and being able to like think critically for themselves, like showing them, like, it's important that we cover this content because it will benefit you in like seeing a world that you may not have seen otherwise. Um, potentially grounding things in research too, right? Maybe finding articles about like why it's important to go in that depth and that breadth of content. Um, and so just finding what will motivate teachers and then having honest conversations of like, this is really important for the shared vision of our district because we we thought about like our students' futures, right? A life of opportunity, being able to have students like have critical discussions, whatever the standards are calling for. Um, and, and I suppose it depends on the grade level too, but that's where I would start. Claire, do you have anything to add? Yeah, the only thing I would add is um, a lot of times when I see those types of gaps in teachers, I try to think about what is the root cause. And so this comes from Art of Coaching, but um, Elena Aguilar talks about like skill, will, or um, knowledge gaps, right? And so it, I think a lot of times as a leader, it can we can think like, oh, teachers just like don't want to do this. But I do think there's an aspect where sometimes like teachers just don't know how to do the thing that we're asking them. So I would can also consider like asking more of those questions of is the gap, right? Like a will gap, like Samantha said, that mindset, those types of questions and research can be really helpful. But if it's a skill or a knowledge gap, it might be like, what does this actually look like? in another department that has to have these conversations about prioritizing content or what does it actually look like to go through the process and really work on that skill with them of if this is our entire unit how do we ask ourselves those questions to really prioritize those key concepts so I think understanding what is their barrier to doing that will really help you identify the right course of action.